think there is a better way to start than with uh, Katalin Ligeti, who is the Dean of Faculty of Law, Economics and Finance of the Luxembourg University. Uh, Katalin, you are a professor of European and International Criminal Law, and you focus primarily on police and judicial cooperation, criminal matters, EU criminal law, comparative criminal procedure, and economic and financial criminal law. And you, are, you were also engaged with policy makers, like when you were a special advisor to, to the Commissioner Eurova. So I would, I would ask you to, if you could set the scene for, for this discussion, what is actually AI in this context? What are the trends? What are the use cases we might imagine in the criminal justice system? And what is the direction in which uh, not only substantive criminal law, but also other areas of criminal law are moving in order to reply to the challenges we are facing? Um, I know there is predictive policing, but I guess there is much more than that, I imagine. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Uri, and uh, very warm welcome to this uh, panel. Uh, as a speaker, I am under strict surveillance to observe yeah. uh, the time, and I shall try to do it. Um, I will uh, spend roughly five minutes to sketch a broad view on what are the interactions between criminal justice and artificial intelligence by also sharing with you some examples for further thought. And then in the second five minutes, I will try to give uh, approaches how we could have trustworthy AI in criminal justice. Maybe before we start off um, setting the scene, I think it's important to have an understanding on criminal justice. Obviously, it's substantive criminal law. Obviously, it's procedural criminal law. It's also international cooperation in criminal matters. But what I will not address, but I would like just to add uh, from the very beginning as a footnote, there is a very important emerging area of international humanitarian law where we also have a lot of criminal justice aspects with the use of AI. I just flag robo-soldiers, crime committed uh, by automated weapon systems used also in uh, controlling borders. These are not imaginary examples. These systems are in operation, creating uh, a number of hesitation for the criminal justice system, but I will not talk about that. So I shall focus more uh, classically on substantive criminal law and procedural criminal law. Now if we zoom in to substantive criminal law, uh, I think uh, we can distinguish at least three areas where artificial intelligence and criminal justice uh, interact. I think the most widely discussed is when artificial intelligence commits crimes. The most well-known example, which is not an imaginary example, is um, our self-driving cars, which can commit uh, offenses. Questions are, uh, I think, uh, uh, quite self-evident, how we can impute liability uh, to an algorithm. Uh, what sort of uh, sanctions may seem useful uh, in case uh, artificial intelligence commits the crime, and what does it mean that a self-driving car commits uh, an offense? The Council of Europe has released a report on that uh, very recently in November 2019, comparing how the various European national systems uh, deal with that, and we see uh, diverging approaches, but also we see um, ways and insights uh, what sort of models and thinking existing already in criminal justice we may use in order uh, to tackle these problems. We impute also criminal liability to corporations or legal persons, broadly speaking, and that approach might be inspiring when we deal uh, with criminal justice. Now, I, I told that um, uh, the example of self-driving cars committing offenses is really not an imaginary one. There was a very important uh, uh, case in the United States where uh, a self-driving Uber uh, uh, hit a lady who eventually died uh, uh, because of the accident. And later on, the US authorities discovered that there was a problem in the algorithm. In fact, the car could not uh, realize pedestrians outside crossroads. And the driver of the car was distracted because of the self-driving 
uh, option in the car. She could have intervened, but because she was distracted, she did not intervene. Um, I think I don't need to outline how many questions this uh, raises. Uh, do we combine individual liability with the liability of the car? Uh, do we have two distinct systems? So I think there, there are manifold questions uh, which evolve. A second important aspect uh, of using artificial intelligence for substantive criminal law is if artificial intelligence becomes an enabler for committing offenses. We can think about many examples, trafficking of drugs via zones, committing terrorist attacks uh, by putting explosives on uh, AI systems. But the most common example that we see becoming uh, a problem are phishing emails. Uh, I think all of you probably have already encountered phishing emails. Usually they are fortunately yet not too sophisticated, so it's relatively easy to detect it uh, if you carefully read the email. But with artificial intelligence, we may have another scale because the algorithm might work uh, more precisely, so it's much more difficult uh, to detect that it's uh, a phishing email. In fact, uh, UNICRI uh, made a study together with Interpol in 2019 to which extent we will see more crimes being committed via AI and whether AI actually leads to new crimes. It's a hotly discussed issue nowadays in criminal justice. And I just um, coin again an example, fake news. Today, fake news is not a criminal offense. It's, of course, um, a phenomenon uh, which is uh, socially uh, probably reproachable, but it's not a criminal offense. Ultimately, if artificial intelligence will be used for spreading fake news in order to destabilize certain systems, the question is whether we should consider fake news as a criminal offense. So as you see, uh, using AI for committing offenses can be in many ways uh, leading to discussing new crimes. Of course, the algorithm itself can be also vulnerable, and that's the third aspect when, so to say, the AI becomes uh, a victim of an offense when it is used or manipulated in a way uh, to commit offenses. If we move on to procedural law, stricto sensu, I think AI can be helpful at least under two perspectives. One is the broad uh, area of predictive justice where a artificial intelligence is used today mostly in sentencing, but one can question to which extent it will be used beyond uh, sentencing in order to make predictions about recidivism. There are already programs in the United States using that, not only in the US, but that's the most uh, well-known and advanced one. And potentially, this type of predictions uh, will be used uh, across systems elsewhere as well. Of course, artificial intelligence, because of its capacity uh, to interpret big data in another way than uh, we do it today, can be very helpful for the investigation and that's the second aspect in criminal procedure where we use artificial intelligence for gathering and assessing evidence. Uh, there are today already um, models uh, for using artificial intelligence for DNA and artificial intelligence leads us to detect uh, aspects of DNA which were not possible so far. Um, an interesting example I would like to uh, share with you and probably less known. Um, recently, um, in fact in 2017, the ICC requested to arrest a warlord uh, in Libya based on information which was derived uh, from images and videos of a satellite system. So the warlord himself uploaded uh, certain images which were then uh, time-stamped and triangulated with other uh, evidence in that case, so images of uh, roads, houses, uh, vegetation were then confronted with other and correlated with other uh, types of evidence in order uh, to find uh, proof that he actually ordered, uh, in that case, um, um, execution of civilians. 
Now, in, in the case, in this particular case in the ICC, it was still humans who did um, the comparison between and the correlation of the triangulation of the different types of evidence, but one can think uh, that in uh, the future, this, um, this will be done uh, by artificial intelligence. Um, I think the mostly discussed uh, aspect uh, of artificial intelligence is predictive uh, policing, where um, the underlying idea is very uh, simple. Some crimes, such as theft and robberies, are uh, to a large extent predictable because the criminals with a distinguishable profile tend to commit the same type of offense at the same uh, uh, location or even at the same type uh, of the day. Now, if we look at this broad arena of interaction between criminal justice and, uh, and artificial intelligence, and we look into the um, recommendations uh, of the EU High Commission on uh, Artificial Intelligence to create trustworthy artificial intelligence, I will just spend two minutes to try to attempt uh, how this, this can be done and what are really uh, um, uh, the major questions. One uh, aspect uh, that the Commission's high-level expert group uh, emphasized is human agency and oversight. Can we get rid of human agency and oversight in criminal justice? The question, once again, is not theoretical because we see in civil justice the emergence of so-called internet courts um, the, I think the most advanced ones are in China. They are used uh, for a certain number of um, uh, um, case types, mostly in intellectual property, where it seems that it's uh, more technical litigation, so artificial intelligence can be better used. Now, in criminal justice, we have very um, stringent rules on human involvement. I just refer to prohibition of hearsay, even the prohibition to submit documentary evidence and the need to actually the judge confront the evidence, uh, oral evidence in court. So it's difficult to see that we would get rid of human oversight uh, in the criminal justice system. I think the, the biggest um, um, questions are probably related to transparency, and I will be very brief on that because I think Lani will uh, uh, address this um, as well. But we have the expectation in criminal justice that, of course, evidence has to be uh, explained and the artificial intelligence has to respond to a certain uh, um, degree of reason and the question is what is this degree of reason and how we can explain uh, the um, conclusions that artificial intelligence draws. There is an entire evolving discussion around the black box, how uh, algorithms make uh, predictions and, uh, and conclusions and the question is how can the defense challenge that. That's on the one hand a question of explicability of the decisions and conclusions uh, made by artificial intelligence, but it's also a question of equality of arms. The defense must be equipped, technically equipped, and be able to use expert assistance in order to challenge evidence which is based on artificial intelligence. Uh, in that regard, I just mentioned one example, and I close with that, is, the, uh, is, is a, actually um, a, a case uh, related uh, to the use of artificial intelligence for predicting recidivism in the United States, where a software was used in order to uh, predict whether the perpetrator is a recidive or not, and uh, on the basis of that uh, uh, prediction, uh, uh, in that uh, particular case, Third versus Loomis, um, uh, the person, the offender, uh, got a higher uh, uh, sentence. Now, he challenged uh, the sentence saying uh, that there was uh, no way to challenge the accuracy, actually, of this uh, prediction, and his right to an individual sentence was violated. 
Now the U.S. Uh, uh, Wisconsin court uh, treating that case uh, came to the conclusion that in that particular uh, case, the court uh, reached the decision by relying also on other independent factors in addition uh, to uh, the AI in order to make its conclusion. So in that case, it's all right. But it already, I think, gives us uh, an, an insight what sort of uh, questions and discussions we may have. To conclude, I think uh, we, have, we have to watch very carefully in criminal justice the use of artificial intelligence. I personally find it regrettable that so far at least at the European Union, the discussion is very much limited to substantive criminal law, and there is very little uh, emphasis uh, on procedural rights and procedural criminal law, and I think we should broaden our view in criminal justice in the policy making when we look into artificial intelligence. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for this eye-opening, uh, actually, in intervention, because we often speak only about um, AI in predictive policing, but there is so much more in the criminal justice system. And our next speaker, uh, who has a PowerPoint, so he will do it from there, is uh, Frank, Frank uh, Schurmans, who is a member director of the Belgian Supervisory Body for Police Information, or uh, Organ de Contrôle, or Control Organ. He's also an attorney general cor uh, at the Court of Appeal uh, in Ghent, and a teaching assistant at the Ghent University. Now, Frank, uh, Belgium often likes to do things differently. I, I live here for a while. I still don't understand how professional football is organized. You have Division 1A and 1B. You cut the points in half of the season. You have three playoffs. It's very difficult to understand. And in similar fashion, Belgium also chose to be the only EU member state to have a separate supervisory authority for the supervision and enforcement of the Law Enforcement Directive 2016-680 because all the other member states have the same supervisor as for the GDPR. And uh, so it's great that we have you here and your body became, or your authority became sort of famous for stopping uh, or banning the facial recognition at Brussels airport. So maybe you can tell us more about that particular case, but also generally about your views uh, or views of your uh, authority about the challenges we are addressing in this panel. So you have- okay. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Well, that we have a complicated um, uh, structure in our system, so everything, we, we have a Flemish part, we have a Brussels, you know, we have the Walloon part, so it's, it's always complicated here. So we're used to making complicated things. Actually, I must say we have four DPAs, eh? so uh, uh, we have an, a, a special DPA also for the intelligence services, and then there's another one who has a little, very little, small competence. So we, we have some issues in, uh, in coordinating um, the different DPAs, but I think, but uh, it's not uh, the uh, it's not the aim of the uh, of the topic today. There are reasons, um, and the police was uh, was asking for it to have a special specific uh, DPA. I will not go on the, uh, the, the that, that I have two slides on the Belgian um, uh, DPA landscape. Um, uh, you will uh, you will have the possibility to read that. We're relatively small, and we just started in September 2018 and we are now at full speed with 10, uh, 10 people, so for overall 50,000 police officers that we have uh, in Belgium. We also are oversight over the passenger information unit. You know that every um, member state should have a passenger information unit. We're also dealing with that and customs uh, partly. Okay, we'll come to the... Um, uh, to the uh, I, I've tried to focus on two things, predictive policing and predictive justice. Um, Caitlin has already said something. I'm not a specialist in predictive policing. In fact, I have been stu starting to study it uh, for a few weeks because I knew I had to be, uh, to be in the panel. But I'm also <laughs> at the um, uh, teaching assistant at the uh, 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 University of Ghent. And then there are, there are a few um, uh, professors who are. Uh, so I, I borrowed uh, their knowledge to, um, to try to, to assess what, what, do we, what do we understand under predictive policing. I've got there uh, a definition uh, which seems uh, relatively clear, um, uh, but still, uh, predictive policing, when I read the... Um um, 
there are three, uh, three main categories, we could say, um, when we talk about predicting policing, that is, a system that, predictive, that predicts um, place and time of an offense, a system that predicts the victim, you could be a potential victim, or the system that predicts a perpetrator, you, would, you could be a, a future perpetrator. Of course, um, from the angle of privacy, those are three very, very, very different uh, things. So it's important to know what sort of uh, predictive policing that we are talking about. Certainly when we try to put things into law, uh, what, uh, what type of predicting policing are we talking about? I can say that uh, at this time, when I've read, uh, I've read a l relatively a lot now about predictive policing, all the models in place uh, try to uh, make a model um, anticipating future crime events place on place and time. It's um, rarely, I've found two things, two models that try to predict um, perpetrators. Um, the current applications in Europe, I'm not talking about the United States, but because obviously it's, a, it's a U, mainly a US thing. In Europe, it's very unknown, very unknown. Uh, there are uh, four uh, different types of um, predictive policing applications. I've put them there. And um, I've put also um, the, uh, the, the countries and the cities that have already tried in police forces certain systems. I will not go over them, uh, a crime anticipation system. Uh, Pre-COPS, Pretpol, and HunchLab. There are obviously software companies, which uh, one of us, uh, one of them is here. Uh, uh, IBM, Hitachi, Microsoft are um, involved in um, in predictive policing systems and developing uh, algorithms. The majority of the empirical studies that I've seen are based in the U.S., uh, uh, mostly in the context of uh, big and large cities. The unit of analysis uh, used in those studies um, is in most of the time, the, there's a grid, they use a grid level, so place okay. and time. 16, I found two uh, studies, I have, as I have said, that have tried to predict uh, potential perpetrators. But there's, it's clear that there are still a lot of methodological uh, issues. Eh? What is the input of variables? Which variables do we put in the system? What is the choice of grid when we go try to predict place and time? Is it a city? Is it a sector? Is it a neighborhood? Do we do it on street level? Um, those are all um, uh, questions that have to be resolved. There's evidently uh, the problem of data quality and data that isn't simply not there, so data missing. Yeah? There's, a certain, there's certainly a risk of confirmation bias. There are temporal issues. Um, there are different methods. Um, three main methods uh, of predictive policing, uh, the near repeat method when we look at the history uh, of a certain area, uh, how many offenses uh, there have been in certain areas. There's a supervising machine learning met method, that's the only method that tries to predict on the individual level, be it a victim or perpetrator, uh, to predict um, potential victims or perpetrators. And it's clear we have um, still some uh, issues on um, evaluation, uh, not any of those uh, evaluations that I have read uh, has come to a, a, a clear and, and specific conclusion as to the effectiveness of those, uh, of those systems, um, as to the effectiveness of um, predictive policing itself. Is it more effective than traditional methods that we use today, which is a, a hotspot analysis? We look at the crime, in, in, uh, the crime rates in, uh, in certain areas in, uh, in the past, and we, we try to, to, uh, to take some lessons out of that, and we try to, to, to aim our police efforts to those, uh, to those areas. What are the working conditions in practice, and what sort of crime? It's uh, clear that uh, some crimes are not very suited for a predictive policing while others are uh, more suited. A lot of unresolved privacy issues. Um, this is a privacy conference, uh, so it's obviously that there are a lot of privacy issues. Uh, as, I, as I have said, data quality. Uh, we essentially put police data. Uh, the whole question is how uh, reliable uh, is police data? And I'm now uh, about two years in function on the Belgian police database. 
and I can say that I thought as a prosecutor that I could always rely on police data uh, that were put in the, um, in the files. I can see that um, there are a lot of problems with the accuracy uh, of, uh, of police databases. I think when it's uh, the case in Belgium, I'm very confident that it's the case in everywhere. So there's absolutely that, uh, that problem. Uh, the security of information, and how, uh, who has access, uh, how do we store all that information. The involvement of private companies is uh, evidently a, a big issue. Eh? This, uh, privatizing police, um, certainly in Europe and certainly in my country, that is a very, very big issue. Uh, we are very reluctant to, to draw private companies into law enforcement. How should law enforcement make use of those predictions? Um, or that also is a very, um, very, very big issue. Uh, there is the issue of probable cause. Is it because I'm in a certain place that I am, uh, is that sufficient to be considered as a suspect? Uh, is it considered uh, when I walk around that, uh, that street that um, it is suspicious that I, that I am at that place at that time? Um, there is a higher risk of ethnic profiling, which is evident uh, when we, there is, that is risks. That risk is already here today in everyday police working. So when we use those sorts of uh, systems, um, how do we deal with it? The biased data evidently is a, uh, a big issue. So I think the need forward, we, uh, we need more testing and more research uh, uh, methods and more uh, research into the, the systems. The need of legis legislative framework, um, well, that's a big issue. Should we do this at EU, EU level or should we try at uh, member state level? Um, I'm not really clear on that. I'm a, a bit reluctant to, to do that on EU level. I'm a, let's say um, it's difficult, I think, with the different systems of uh, policing and judicial systems that we have in Europe to try to make a European uh, regu regulation. Um, so there is all kinds of questions that we have to, uh, to address. Um, uh, personally, uh, should, should we do are the, private, uh, the, the, the privacy laws, uh, the GDPR, the law enforcement uh, directive, is that enough uh, at, at this time? I, uh, I'm not so sure. Um, I would start with um, certainly only time and place predictive policing, There's so no predictive policing where, where we try to, uh, to do that at the uh, level of the victim or, or the level of the perpetrator. So those are all uh, questions that we have to face when we try to, uh, uh, to make a, um, when we try to make, yes, in fact in Belgium, yes, uh, very quickly. So we don't have any system of uh, predictive uh, policing. There is an ongoing research at my university with the Antwerp police. Um, what we do have is, is heat maps, um, but that is, I think, common in, in, in a lot of countries, um, but no really um, real systems of predictive policing. I will go uh, very um, short on the Brussels case because evidently that is also an aspect of artificial intelligence, which so we had with the supervisory body a file uh, on uh, facial recognition systems in the Brussels airport. So there were four cameras in an exit when you uh, went to the Brussels airport here in Zaventem between 2017 and 2019. You were, um, uh, you were taken by those cameras. They started without any DPIA. That is also typical, uh, probably not only for Belgian police. They start something and then afterwards they start thinking, oh, is what I'm doing legal? Um, <laughs> That was a problem, so uh, it was an, an interview by the Commissioner General that took our attention. We didn't know it was used, but there was an interview uh, with the Commissioner General who was very, uh, very enthusiastic about the system, and on the basis of that interview, we started an investigation. Um, bottom line of it, it was, uh, it's illegal, but it's illegal uh, on, uh, because of the Belgian uh, uh, law of the, function of the functioning of the police. Um, our law states that uh, intelligent, artificial intelligence systems is only allowed with AN, A, uh, ANPR technology, so automatic number plate recognition systems, that is allowed. Everything else that has to do with artificial intelligence and law enforcement is forbidden at this time. So that's, uh, that was very clear. You should think that also police forces would know that. 
but we had to make them clear that it's, uh, that it was not possible. I will not go on the judiciary because my time is running out. Uh, we don't use in the judiciary any, uh, anything like predictive justice. Um, our Minister of Justice was, um, uh, had that question in Parliament very recently. Uh, we do not use it. Um, the only thing that we use, uh, that was, what was the Minister's idea, could we use artificial intelligence in the judiciary? He said, maybe uh, in the future, uh, when it comes to managing of resources, and those, so the assessing the workload of a judge or a prosecutor, it could support the judge in complex um, civil claims, um, uh, because uh, nowadays we see that when you are hit by a car in Ghent and when you are hit by a car in Antwerp, it's certainly that you will not have the same amount of money as a victim, so there is a, a, a problem of diverse um, damages, damage claims, um, the support of the, claim, of the plaintiff in choosing the most efficient procedure that would also be uh, by, in the procedure of collective debt, but that's civil procedure. That were the only three uh, things that our Justice Minister saw uh, for predictive, police, uh, predictive justice. I'm going to, start here, uh, to stop here because uh, otherwise I'm running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. That was very interesting, uh, especially this case of facial recognition at the Brussels Helper. I think it was something that everyone wanted to hear about. Uh, our next speaker is Lani Cosette. Uh, she's a member of Microsoft's uh, EU government affairs team in Brussels, where she leads Microsoft's engagement on internet jurisdiction and cross-border issues. She's also on the board of directors for the Cross-Border Data Forum. Uh, Lani, you've been following this law enforcement regulations from a business perspective for a while now. Uh, and I know companies such as yours would not like to act as law enforcers. Uh, and I agree with that. I think we should probably tax companies uh, more and then use that money to reinforce our own law enforcement <laughs> rather than shoving law enforcement tasks to you. Uh, so uh, I was wondering what is your impression and what would be a proper regulatory reply to some of the technologies that companies such as yours might be able to develop, eventually sell to the law enforcement, like facial recognition or predictive policing. Uh, what, what do you think about uh, how should we regulate this in the future? And what is your experience with the regulation of this criminal justice sector so far? Thank you, Uri. Um, Microsoft is happy to be discussing this with all of you at CPDP. Um, indeed, uh, we have been, like it or not, in a very public conversation regarding law enforcement issues now. Um, I mean, it's been seven or eight years. And so before I get into the nitty gritty of talking about how Microsoft is thinking about potential regulation, um, I, I think it is worth calling attention more broadly to this engagement of stakeholders generally when it comes to criminal justice. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the e-evidence file recently and uh, without going into great level of detail, I, I think there is something to learn from that process um, now that we're beginning the process of thinking about uh, regulation of AI in the, in the area of uh, police security and justice. Uh, you know, by proxy, Microsoft hears a lot of views from our customers, our individuals, governments. Um, we're selling our technology all over the world um, to lots of different people, lots of different organizations. And we have, we, we then become, you know, intaking so many points of view that represent uh, society very broadly. So I, I would emphasize how important it is to have a broad conversation, um, even Frank's example that he himself was surprised to learn that facial recognition was being used at the Brussels airport is a perfect illustration of, of um, what I'm talking about. You know, I, I spend time talking to law enforcement and it's a completely different conversation than the next day I come to CPDP or RightsCon and it's, a, it's an entirely different conversation. So I, I do think it's important as we begin the process of um, thinking about uh, regulation, whether that goes beyond data protection, who needs to be involved in that conversation. So we're, we ensure that all the interests across society are uh, taken into account as we move forward. Um, so I, I would like to summarize the three areas um, where Microsoft considers um, regulation would be useful. 
uh, this is very much a work in progress. I think it's been about a year now that we've been talking about um, some principles. I won't go into that because I think it's a, a bit of old news and it'll come through when I you know, get to the discussion around the regulation. Uh, but I, I think that we are now moving to the phase where we need to drill down into what, you know, what are these principles and what would this look like in which areas of law um, should we consider um, taking a good look at where, um, where the, the market and all of the actors involved could use some, some clarity in how we move forward. So I think the first area has to do with this, um, this concern around uh, fairness and bias. Uh, it's something that um, Kathleen mentioned, um, when she, uh, very interesting um, to call attention to the use of predictive policing and sentencing. Indeed, this is, I, I think, a very good example that really illustrates the, the grave consequences if the technology doesn't work perfectly, if the data is biased, if there's something going on with the algorithm that um, really um, tends to confirm biases that already exist. This is something that I think we first need to be aware of, but we're getting to the point now where, you know, how, how can we think about regulation that could uh, directly uh, help um, improve the situation, but also create an incentive so that companies like Microsoft um, and others are able to sell technology that is more accurate and takes into account the biases. Um, I think that's an important first step. So the, I would call attention to some of the work that was done um, by an investigative reporter in the U.S. and ProPublica, there, there was a quite extensive look at uh, a particular company that a lot of the prison systems are using in the U.S. Um, called Compass. And interestingly, uh, there, was, there was some testing done, but it was done only internally. And it wasn't until the investigative journalists got to it that they really you know, dug in and discovered and were able to define in a very public way you know, what, what were these biases and then engendered a, a number of uh, research projects by academics who took a hard look. And I think this is exactly the kind of um, spirit of competition and third party analysis that uh, we really need to see um, encouraged in regulation. So I could imagine a regulation that would require uh, legitimate third party testing done in a transparent way so that um, the companies that are making the technology are incentivized um, to have a good look internally and understand what they're you know, putting into the market and uh, also having the, the transparent and publicly available assessment of what this bias looks like and what the harms look like um, could apply you know, to organizations that are considering using the technology or even you know, uses that we may not think about. But I, in, indeed, you can imagine an expert at trial um, who may need to understand um, and present evidence uh, calling attention to some of those unfair biases. The other, um, the other suggestion, concrete su suggestion in the area of fairness and bias would go to uh, better data documentation. Uh, there's a lot that could be done uh, to help explain um, in a more uh, consistent way uh, what, you know, what goes into the algorithm, what goes into the data set, um, so, that, uh, so that users of the technology can take a good look at what testing has already been done, um, what is the data set, what was the thinking behind um, you know, how the algorithms were tested with that particular data set. Um, the, we are already piloting um, some use of this um, uh, consistent use of data documentation in a number of, um, of, of our uh, production of, of the technology internally. So it remains to be seen you know, how this could be written into some sort of regulation, but I think it is uh, an important safeguard uh, when we think about addressing the issues around fairness and bias. Um, the next issue um, I think raised uh, by your eye in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the session itself is, you know, the utility of the existing instruments in data protection, uh, the law enforcement directive and the GDPR. Um, on this point, I, I think it, we are interested in more input and, you know, what, in, in how this could work. We are aware of um, some divergent interpretations of what it means to have a substantial public interest. And this, is what, this was the core question, I think, in two different cases that came up in both Sweden and Denmark, um, with courts um, ruling either way in applying what they would consider to be a substantial public interest and um, whether the means used were proportionate or not. So 
uh, yeah, I think we should be thinking about whether there's a more consistent and harmonized approach um, we could take when it comes to looking at um, this particular test as it applies um, to the use of predictive policing uh, systems. And then in the third area, I wanted to highlight um, the issue of um, democratic freedoms and human rights. Uh, this, is, this is something that I think came up, um, interestingly, the courts are ahead of the policymakers, and I wanted to call attention to what I thought was an interesting analysis in a case um, before the UK High Court, uh, Bridges v. South Wales Police. Um, I don't want to say that the outcome of this case and the factors that the court took into account are the right ones, but I think, I think it's a good way to start a conversation about how you move from principles and fairness and bias and get into the nitty gritty of you know, exactly what needs to be regulated and you know, what kinds of measures and, and tests and considerations um, can go into an overall assessment of um, whether or not a particular use of for example, facial recognition technology, whether it would really make sense to do so. Um, being cognizant of the time, I have maybe about two minutes, two minutes to run through the six factors. Um, so starting with um, the court, the court um, called attention to six different considerations. The first had to do with um, public engagement prior to use, and this has to do with notice and consent, which is always um, a challenge when you're dealing with public spaces. And in that case, um, the court called attention to the fact that, um, that the police, in this, insta in, in, in this instance, um, used social media to publicize that uh, the facial recognition technology was going to be used. Um, there was also some um, broad you know, posters and postcards that were, that were circulated. Um, there was, uh, the second factor had to do with um, uh, proportionate, proportionate restrictions having to do with a limited use of the images and the databases that were applied. Um, the police used databases that included uh, individuals that were suspects from prior crimes, um, were wanted on warrants, or that had escaped custody. So that there was some attempt, um, the court recognized, to limit um, um, the to limit the, the, the data that was used um, when doing the identification. Um, the third uh, point the court called attention to was the deletion of false positives, um, which um, I, th I think was a, an, a useful to include. Um, finally, we've also had um, heard reference today the use of human intervention, um, the idea of human agency, and that uh, in this case, uh, the police required to two looks by humans to make sure that there was a match or not a match. If the match was incorrect, then the images were deleted. Um, interestingly, there was also a reference to the use of data documentation and the use of um, data protection impact assessments. Um, finally, uh, there was a reference as well to third party testing. So I, uh, I think that this is an, uh, a useful place to start the conversation. Things seem to be moving fast. Um, regulation in 100 days in Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe not 100 days, but uh, we have to get to it. So we look forward to being part of this conversation. And I hope that um, this conversation is quite broad, not limited only to law enforcement and the data protection people, but all of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lani. I think you, you basically made a really nice transition towards uh, Anna, our next speaker, who is from the European Commission, but also you gave us a lot of elements for the discussion uh, that we will have in the end. But before that, we'll wrap up the panel with uh, Anna Moschibroda, who has spent the last five and a half years working for the Data Protection Unit in DG Justice of the European Commission, focusing mostly on data protection and law enforcement. And uh, uh, Anna is a very special person because she's one of the three people in this world that I know that actually understand interoperability regulations. <laughs> uh, more about that in the four o'clock panel in La Cave. Uh, since we speak here now about regulatory approaches, I'm super happy to have someone from the commission with us to tell us basically what's cooking. You know, What are your plans for legislative <laughs> proposals regulating AI in criminal justice? We have seen some leaked white papers recently, but nothing really concrete. Also, we have the GDPR that is directly applicable since 2018. We have the Law Enforcement Directive, which is basically now completely transposed because everyone but Spain, Slovenia, and some German lender, contrary to what we heard yesterday, have transposed the directive. So do we actually need more regulation 
or is it enough to rely on the, the current data protection instruments? So, uh, good morning. Uh, so, I think we actually heard quite a lot about uh, many of aspects of those questions already. So, as regards the plans of the European Commission, we are all aware about the, uh, the, the ethics, uh, the, uh, the high-level expert group published uh, ethic guidelines in April last year. Uh, you all know that in a uh, in, in few weeks, uh, in February, there will come the, the white paper. The white paper will be followed by the public consultations and what will be there in the white paper will be actually factors setting out, well, there will be some sort of context and factors relating to how, what the future regulation could look like. Um, and it is following the public consultations after the white paper that the further decisions will be made. So at the moment there is uh, no decisions relating whether or not there will be a specific regulations relating to artificial intelligence. There is also no decisions relating to whether or not there will be any specific measures addressing the needs of the law enforcement sector. Uh, so, so there will be a consultation, so I invite you to, to, to follow that up and, uh, uh, and I also, I second the views that this type of panels and this type of discussion is very relevant and needed and it's, uh, I'm, I'm very thrilled with the previous presentations because that really put some meat on the bones, I think. So is the, is the current uh, framework sufficient? So we know that there is a framework, there is a framework relating to fundamental rights in the first place. We have a charter, we have the EU data protection law with law enforcement directive, and I can only confirm that in terms of the completeness of transposition, it doesn't look that bad. Uh, three member states uh, still need to do some work. Uh, of course, the Commission will also look on how that transposition is done, meaning on the um, um, correctness of that transposition. So we will still uh, need to conclude on that issue. And um, we have been also uh, uh, talking quite a lot about the specific risk and challenges that arise. We, there, there, the, the bias has been mentioned, discrimination issues has been mentioned, data accuracy, uh, and many others. And um, what I, I think also is also seconding the previous presentations, what I think is important to have in mind that, you know, I think that using the artificial intelligence in the context of criminal systems has impact not only on the data subject that is then subject to certain decisions, that is true, uh, but also to the society at large. And I can only um, basically quote back the digital rights and tell it too, where the Court of Justice has already said that there is this issue of the larger societal impact on the technology, which is, for instance, the fear of surveillance in those particular cases. And there is, I think, also something that, um, that we would need to further exploring, which is the impact of those technologies of actual principles of the criminal justice. So how does it play with the fair child, the presumptions of innocence, uh, and so on? I, it goes a bit out of the remit of data protection, uh, but data protection also makes a reference to the other fundamental rights and the other principles that we need to uphold. So, is the law enforcement directive sufficient? Uh, well, uh, I, well, I think there are principles in the law enforcement directive that are very relevant to uh, regulating artificial intelligence. Uh, there, it's not specifically about artificial in intelligence, but they are very relevant, and those are fairness, accountability, accuracy, data protection by design, rules on automated decision making, rules on processing sensitive data, and data protection impact assessment, those in particular. And of course we have other basic principles such as data minimizations on purpose specifications, which somehow sometimes get a little bit forgotten into discussion about artificial intelligence, but they are not being rendered un unapplicable by those technologies, so they are, we still have to take them into account. Um, everybody in this room knows those principles, so I will not uh, repeat and, and, and uh, kind of <laughs> give you a bit of a uh, school lecture about them, so rather to offer a few, maybe few reflections on how they play out, and maybe I will actually start with um, 
accuracy and accountability, because recently there's quite a lot of discussions about um, the errors in data, and we are talking both about the, the testing data, which come with the errors, and then, of course, it has an impact on the the final performing of the artificial intelligence systems. There is also a question of the errors in the, the, the production data. There is errors related to the decisions that those systems make, so those decisions being one way or the other incorrect. Those de decisions get recorded in the criminal files and the, the, they are processed within the criminal process. They are also being shared with, um, well, with other agencies, with the other, other police forces, but also, well, beyond even borders of the given member states. So, um, what can we do? Does the law enforcement directive say something about it? Well, first of all, we do have a principle of, of that, um, data accuracy in Article 4. So, um, data has to be accurate and data controller must ensure the data which is inaccurate has to be erased or rectified without a delay. And I think, well, many of those, basically all those principles have to be read together. But these principles of data accuracy has to be in particular read together with, with data, with accountability, which is also for the data controller to demonstrate the compliance um, and ensure the compliance uh, with the data protection principles and with the data protection by design, because this is also the moment of actually uh, implementing those data into the systems uh, themselves. Um, what that would mean in practice, I mean, it's very difficult to say, but I'm just few reflections on my side. So we already heard a lot about testing, uh, basically also making sure and considering any data flaws that you might have relating to both testing and production data and addressing those flaws. So basically considering, do I, is there a risk of data being incorrect one way or the other? Is there a risk of data being biased? How can I address these issues within the further process of, for instance, I don't know, configuring the system and so on? Um, there is also the question of auditing of external control, the third party control of those systems. And, uh, well, if you understand data accuracy um, and data accountability as a kind of procedural rules, this is also what data uh, controllers need to address. So basically they need to have a certain procedure that take those issues into account and they can demonstrate that those issues have been actually taken into account. That of course, again, all everything is connected. So the, the impact assessment is a tool also that helps to, to, to consider those issues. Uh, in, in within that topic, I also wanted to, to, to go and talk about certain specific provisions of law enforcement directive that might, m might be helpful. And one is that uh, the law enforcement directive requires to make a distinction between the different categories of data subjects which I think might address certain risks that it basically enhances certain understanding what type of data that we're talking about. Uh, being categorized in a certain risk has a certain impact for the data subject concerns. There is also Article 7 in Law Enforcement Directive that talks that you need to actually make a distinction between assessments on one side and the facts on the other side. So this is another yet principle built in into directive that helps addressing certain issues relating to data accuracy and then accuracy of the actual decision based on them. And finally, uh, in terms of you know sharing these decisions, rectifying mistakes and so on, th there is of course data subject rights. There's a big discussion how they will be exercised in, in the context of those systems. But there is also principle, of course, that incorrect data has to be rectified. Uh, the information about incorrect data, because if that information is shared, then information is verified as incorrect, there will be um, a big impact on, on the data subject concern. So uh, there is an obligation to actually inform all the recipients of the incorrect data that such an issue uh, uh, had taken place. So that's again Article 7 of Law Enforcement Directive and Article 16 on data subject rights that it kind of repeats the same, the same principle. If you know that you've shared something which is not correct, you are under obligation to inform the recipient of the data. Um, I see that I have uh, 
uh, that I have very little time, so I would go very brief, briefly through, through other aspects. So we talked about um, data protection by design, and I think it's, uh, that uh, one can only emphasize this principle once, uh, once and more. And I think it's also quite important to stress that it is within data protection by design that one has to take into consideration measures designed to implement data protection principle, meaning all of the principles, uh, so including data minimization, including data accuracy, including data account, um, including accountability. Um, so that would also call for the measures that that system actually is designed in a way that allows effective auditing. Um, and then, because of the time, I would go basically just to say uh, what are maybe final challenges relating to uh, a specific uh, challenges relating to the artificial intelligence. So I already mentioned the execute, the, like how how we're going to go about the, the the data subject rights. Uh, again, there is a framework for the data subject rights within within the directive. There is, however, ha quite a big scope for the national laws to do so. Um, and also uh, going back to the previous panelists, that is, of course, um, law enforcement directive requires that the ground for the processing is actually the law. So there has to be a legal framework allowing for the processing and specifying the conditions of that processing. Um, there is a challenge relating to, to the enforcement uh, by data protection authorities, by other authorities such as courts. We heard quite a lot about it yesterday, so again, um, I will not repeat. However, this aspect of the dif practical difficulties of actually understanding what those black boxes do is one, uh, uh, an appropriateness of doing the supervisions by data protection or and courts is the other one, especially that because we are talking about processing within the context of a criminal procedure. Um, there, there is this question of traceability, audibility, and again here I would like to mention that the principles that I already have mentioned are accountability, but there are also specific principle, uh, specific provisions in law enforcement directive that might help. That is uh, um, the requirement to, to have records and also the specific requirements to have logs. So you, um, basically the system has to be uh, built up um, to, to honor those uh, requirements. Um, on the verifications of errors, I've already mentioned, I will not go back to them. Um, data protection impact assessments, which in that field would, uh, would be uh, obligatory, including the consultations with the data protection authorities. This is already in, in, in the law enforcement directive, and I, I think this is a particularly high uh, and appropriate safeguard, uh, the rule that it is applying in that context. And finally, there are certain rules that apply already to any uh, system, uh, any, any data that, uh, system that processes personal data and that applies to the police in, in particular which is the, the obligations to actually do self-monitoring and to have a robust security. Okay, and I think we need to finish here. Yes, yeah, yeah. so yeah, so I will finish here, uh, maybe with the final sentence that I, I really hope that, of course, the law enforcement authorities are also interested in, in gaining trust and having um, legally sound processing and not risking also um, uh, any reputational damage, but also damage to the actual criminal processes that might have. So I think this is also in their interest to take all those factors uh, into account. All right. Well, thank you very much, Anna, for this intervention. To my simple mind, uh, the conclusion would be if we spent uh, uh, almost a decade preparing, negotiating, and transposing laws, then maybe we should try to make them work first before we start adopting new laws. Uh, but that actually leads me to uh, open the floor for questions. We have some helpful staff members over there who would like, who have the mic, so if you could pass the mic to 
the colleague over there, and then there's a colleague over there, and the colleague over here. So these are the three we'll take in one round. So the first one is over there. Excuse me. Uh, the first one was over there. Oh. Over there. Okay. Sorry. <coughs> uh, hi, I'm Chi Zhang from Leiden University. I have a question for Anna and the rest of the panel members, uh, which is, I, uh, I heard that you talked uh, about many times of the data accuracy, but to my understanding that um, there is a nuanced difference or to some extent there's a huge di difference between the data accuracy and evidence accuracy and information accuracy. I wanna hear some of the more uh, response to that, thank you. Okay. Then we have a second question there somewhere in the back. If you could identify yourself, please. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I'm Irma Erdogan from Galatasaray University, Istanbul. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the data collected uh, for preventive purposes. Can we use it during criminal procedures? And do you think that purpose limitation uh, would be considered together with the principles of criminal procedures, though, such as the po uh, fruit of the poisonous tree. So can the court uh, discard such data? Uh, the second question is, what's going to happen to our right to remain silent with the IOT, uh, IOT at our homes and you know, all the data collected around like by CCTVs and everything? So thank you. All right, thanks. And then we have one question here in the front. And then we'll reply to them. Hi, my name is Martina and I'm an academic from uh, Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland and also uh, from uh, IRCP at Ghent University. And uh, I have a follow-up question and comment uh, on the issue whether or not we need uh, artificial intelligence, special uh, regulation on AI in criminal justice system. And uh, this question also keeps me busy. And uh, my reflection is that if we compare GDPR uh, to the law enforcement directive, then we can find that the law enforcement directive does not uh, rely on the principle of transparency, which is one of the crucial principles uh, in GDPR. So uh, this uh, lack of the principle of transparency uh, in the directive in my opinion, it has vast consequences because if we compare the list of the rights of the subject, uh, of the data subject, then we can see that uh, in the GDPR there is a right of uh, information and a meaningful information about the logic involved against um, automatic decision making and profiling. And if we compare this provision to the provision in law enforcement directive, then we can see that uh, there is no a corresponding provision in the directive, but just uh, Article 12 speaks about uh, reasonable steps that uh, has to be undertaken to uh, inform the person about uh, automated decision making and profiling. So my question is uh, whether that could be the step towards further research on uh, the need for special provision on AI. So to recap my, my comment, is the lack of transparency or could it be treated like an excuse to extend the uh, provisions on uh, AI? I mean, whether or not the lack of transparency, uh, which has a consequences if we look into the automated decision making and profiling regulation, uh, could be used as an excuse or a need for further regulation on this matter. Thank you. So, uh, Anna, you can start first. Uh, yes, um, so uh, very good question. So starting maybe from evidence uh, versus data accuracy. Uh, I think it uh, it goes, um, well, um, I, I think there are many aspects to data accuracy and how they are seen in the context of criminal justice and uh, criminal process. So of course there is this issue of like how the evidence is then finally assessed by the courts and or the admissibility of evidences and that aspect is basically under the remit of the national um, procedural rules of the member states. Uh, and those rules might, might differ. Um, on the purpose limitation, 
Um, so, and basically, I think the, there was a broader question relating how, uh, how the per principles of law enforcement directive can be read or that do they influence the principles uh, um, of the criminal process. Uh, and uh, that's exactly one of the things that I, I think is a very good question to, to have looked at how they interplay, but that, that I think that there is, there is these interconnections and, uh, and, and relations. And, um, and again, I think that the purpose limitation is still alive and has to be considered. And uh, the fact that, you know, that certain data has been used, I don't know, for instance, for testing and for developing the AI should not be an excuse neither to kind of prolong the life of this data beyond the certain retention periods, neither there should be excuse or then the data kind of coming back into the, 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 um, the, the realm of the actual criminal uh, process and procedure. So uh, um, I would say that uh, the purpose limitation has to be respected and enforced. The right to remain silent, again, this is the, the, the question on how um, the, the artificial intelligence impacts on the, the principles of criminal justice. I think there are people in the room who could actually say much more on this than me. Uh, but it is definitely something that, uh, that needs further examination. And uh, on the right of transparency, uh, yes, it is true that Article 4 does not explicitly mention the right of transparency. Uh, and it is true that the articulations of the data subjects' rights is different in that respect between GDPR and law enforcement directive. And it was made um, uh, with having in mind the fact that the law enforcement sector might have a some certain specific needs and not everything has to be uh, or should be even um, disclosed. I would, however, not agree that there is not principle of transparency in the law enforcement directive. So the fact that the certain things or the certain uh, the specific rights or the specific provisions are articulated differently should not prevent us from actually um, interpreting the overall uh, spirit of the directive in a way of ensuring uh, transparency. So one should all again take into consideration the fairness principle. One should again take into consideration the, um, the, the accountability principle. There are information requirements, the right of information is under the directive. Uh, and in, there is also the certain practical aspect to it, meaning that um, uh, in the context of law enforcement, it might be uh, that, uh, we, for instance, we see or we know that uh, data subject rights are much less willing or much less informed, it might be also the case. Uh, on that. So basically they are not actually exercising their rights uh, um, um, in, in the criminal field as much as they might do in, 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 in other fields. Thank you, Anna. We have to stop here. So I th I'm pretty yes. sure that Katalin would like to react also to some of the questions or to what Anna said. Yes, just uh, very briefly, I, I, I will not uh, enter into the third uh, aspect of lack of transparency. I, I do agree that uh, uh, the law enforcement directive has a concept of uh, transparency. I, I wanted to um, respond maybe a bit more in detail to the question of data accuracy versus accuracy of evidence, because uh, I think that question touches uh, on, on an aspect which was uh, discussed by Lani about uh, bias and the human in the loop and human involvement. After all, what does uh, artificial intelligence provide us? It provides us uh, with a prediction in that case. Um, how we interpret that prediction and how we actually use it as evidence, I think it's an ultimate uh, human decision, which is also ultimately uh, subjective in the sense whether it's 80% uh, uh, risk of recidivism or 40% risk of recidivism. Uh, this is a decision that humans will input into the system based on cultural, social, and other values. Uh, so I, I think that's, uh, that difference also shows between data and evidence accuracy that, uh, that we have to pay attention to that aspect of bias and, uh, and human in the loop. 
um, purpose limitation, uh, I believe that uh, the example of the South Wales police and, and the factors mentioned very well show that uh, it's being tested, what, what are the, how to interpret purpose limitations, especially to facial recognition and these watch lists which have been developed. I think it's a very good case. We had also a very uh, interesting litigation on that uh, in Germany re in, in relation to the G20 summit in Hamburg where there were also facial recognition and, and watch lists uh, used which were then found by the uh, local data protection commissioner as being in violation of the purpose limitation principle. Now whether we will have also uh, potential uh, impediments to the right of silence, I think that there is potential for that that would uh, require I think a more lengthy uh, discussion on procedural rights and the use of uh, AI to respond to that. Thank you, Katalin. Uh, are there any more questions from the floor? <clears throat> there is one here, uh, here, yes, in the middle. Come closer, yeah, there. All right, go ahead. Thank you very much uh, to the panel. My name is Kayo Petrizidou from Leiden University. Uh, and there was a very interesting point by Ms. Ligeti on equality of arms. Uh, I was wondering if uh, the logic of AI can be sufficiently uh, explained uh, in the court, and if indeed lawyers from the opposite party can. Uh, make use of this uh, explanation. And my second point is, do you think that even judges can uh, understand how AI works and uh, does this uh, have implications on uh, impartiality right. of the court? Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think I would need an hour to uh, answer that question, <laughs> but uh, to limit it rather to uh, one minute, I, I share, uh, I think, uh, the skepticism that you raised that with these mechanisms we need a level of technical expertise where we may end up in litigation of a technical expert uh, assisting the judges and on the other side a technical expert, uh, an expert witness, uh, to, to use the terminology of criminal procedure, assisting the defense and they are discussing and potentially the defendant and the judge uh, have very little knowledge to actually um, assess the validity and the details uh, of this uh, discussion. Uh, however, um, just to inspire the thinking, I believe that AI is not the only aspect where we have uh, this challenge. In any litigation where we have massive, let's say more technical, and I'm not meaning technical in the sense of IT, but also in an economic and financial crime case, very technical aspects of the litigation related to deep aspects of uh, financial law, you, you may find that a generalized judge has a difficulty to engage with all aspects, uh, so to say, uh, uh, of the evidence. So I think this uh, dilemma between uh, specialized judges and general uh, judges and uh, to which extent expert opinions, even beyond AI, is already becoming a contested issue, the relevance of expert opinion and, and the authority of the, the court and the judge uh, to assess it. I think it is an ongoing theme and probably it will get yet another level of relevance with the use of AI. Thank you. And uh, I, the last minute I would give to Frank and, uh, and Lani if you want to react to something you heard from the floor or from the other panelists. Just uh, the last remark, I th that's important, you know, I'm a prosecutor myself. Do not underestimate judges. Uh, if a judge doesn't understand it, then he will acquit. It's very simple. First of all, it's, to, it's on the prosecutor's side to, to understand the techniques that are used. I can assure you that not every judge or every uh, prosecutor can explain DNA. Uh, we use DNA, um, but do we have to know all the technical details of the processing of the DNA? I don't think so. And then we can always use a, a side expert. So I don't think that's a new issue. It's a, it's a, it's a daily issue for prosecutors and, uh, and for judges. And maybe a, an interesting possibility, possibility would be, and but that's criminal procedure law, is that all that sort of techniques could only have in court a, what we call in Belgium a support evidence role. It could never be the decisive, um, the decisive evidence aspect to go to a conviction. Uh, we have several types of evidence that we can use as a prosecutor, but never as a decisive piece of evidence. 
Thank you, Frank. And Lani, I'm sorry, uh, but I can only give you 30 seconds. I know it's, it's unfair, but if you want to say something. I can do 30 something. seconds. Okay, please. Yeah. The point I made about docu, uh, document, data documentation, I think, is an, is an important area where we could really develop some interesting thinking. And um, if you want to have a look at a paper that was written, um, Hannah Wallach uh, was one of the authors. Um, and if you search for data sheets for data sets, she she proposes a very clear way to document a lot of complex ideas. And it's interesting, the discussion makes me realize um, this could be used in courts and the whole, the whole issue of you know, criminal procedure and, and expert witnesses. It's an interesting area for further work. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panelists, thanks to everyone. We have to beat it because the other panel is eagerly waiting. And uh, enjoy the rest of the CPDP, and thanks for coming. <laughs>